Hallelujah. We thank God you've tuned into this message by David Entry at Caris Church. No hand can help you with the fulfillment of your destiny, but the word of God. May God's hand align you further into your destiny through this word. Our, our reading today is when Mary saw him, Rabboni. And then Jesus shows up in the where the disciples had gathered and Thomas was not there and he said to them that it's me you can put your hand feel my my wounds you know and he came back Thomas came and he told Thomas Thomas said no I don't believe it so Jesus came the next week at the time Thomas was there and he said Thomas it's me now Come and feel it. Thomas said, I don't need to do that. My Lord and my God. Verse 30 says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. You know what is coming. It says that the next verse says that, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing ye might have eternal life through his name. All right. So how do you get eternal life? By believing. You get it through his name. How do you get eternal life through his name? By believing. All right. So these are written that you might believe. That what are we supposed to believe? Why are these things written that we, we might believe, right? Believe what? Jesus that what? Jesus I like the word after Jesus. What's the word after the name Jesus? So these things have been written that you might believe that Jesus is. That Jesus, let's all say Jesus is. Jesus is. Say it again. Jesus is. Say it for the last time. Jesus is. Jesus is. Hebrews eleven six that it's impossible to, without faith it's not possible to please God, but for whoever comes to God must believe that he is. So these things are written that you will believe that Jesus is. So these are written that you will believe that Jesus is. Someone say Jesus is. Jesus is. So what is Jesus? What is Jesus? Is that all? What is Jesus? What is Jesus? Remember Matthew chapter 16 when he asked the disciples, who do, verse 13, who do men say I am? Verse 16, Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. All right. So the things that are written in scriptures are written that we will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. These things are written that you will believe that Jesus is. What is Jesus? What is Jesus? That is what determines who a Christian is. The belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. These things have been written that you believe that Jesus is. Let's all say that together. Jesus is. Let's all say that together. Jesus is. One more time. Jesus is. Then is. Now, that is what determines who is a Christian or who is not a Christian. And that version of Jesus in the Quran. It's not the Jesus is that we are talking about. No, no, listen, these things are very important. For, for instance, a, a Hindus have a version of Jesus they, they accept. Buddhists have a version of Jesus they are. Latter-day Saints, Jehovah's Witness. I mean, these things are important. Politicians, right? General people, people somebody on the street, they have the, they are the, version, the version of Jesus they believe. Amen. All right, so... The different, different religions and even a religious groups have a version of Jesus they believe. And some people call themselves Christians, but the, Jesus, the version of Jesus they have makes them not one of us. Yeah. What, what do you mean by Jesus is just a good man? Please, excuse me. Jesus is not just a good man. He is the Christ. So when you read John chapter 1, 
verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and said unto him, Philip found Nathanael and said unto Nathanael, let's all read it out. Let's go from the top. Let's go. Jesus of Nazareth. So we have found him. We have found him. Now, this him is the one the prophets have been talking about. That is what the Bible says, or John in today's region said, Jesus is. They, they saw this guy and they said, we found him. This is the one, this is the one we've been reading. Is it, um, is it called mascot? Can't bother about what was going on. Just he's so happy. I've seen him. I've seen this. That's what happened to Philip. He said, We found him. We have been reading about this guy in Genesis and Exodus. Every Sabbath, we read about him. They've been telling us our stories about him. Moses wrote about him. The law was talking about him. The prophet. So as you go to the synagogue, the synagogue readings leave you with one desire, one question. Who is this person? There is somebody coming. Who is this person? There is somebody coming. Who is this person? Then this Jewish boy said, we have found him. We found him. Who are you talking about? Who? The one who is? He is the one, Moses in the, he said, Moses in the law. So when you read, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, he was not just giving you instructions. He was telling about somebody. That is why if your Christianity is built on thou shalt not, thou shalt not, you have missed it. It's not what you don't do and who you are not and who you don't, it's not so much about that. It's have you found him? Because that is what gives meaning to what you don't do. So if I don't steal and you don't steal, and you think that makes you a Christian, sorry, May. Sorry, May. It does not make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian? We may all be behaving the same way, good behavior, but yours is not born out of discovering Jesus. Christians, the way Christians behave is based on your discovery of Christ, not just thou shalt not fornicate. When you find him, then the law makes sense. When you find him, then religion makes sense. Then prophecy. Suddenly, Isaiah becomes more valuable. It is a Christ he prophesied that makes him a true prophet. It's not his predictions that come to pass. Predictions don't make a person a prophet. Is the Christ in their message, Kadaba Shahaya? Because we have found him of whom Moses in the law and of whom Moses in the law and the prophets they wrote about. We found him. This whole thing has been written that we we believe. In Colossians chapter one, oh boy, this is getting too much for me. It's getting too much. I'm going to verse 17 and 18, but I think it's as my custom is, I just like to indulge in scripture because the verses before keep calling my name. And I don't want to be discourteous, or so. I just want to respect the verses before. They keep calling my name, even though I'm not talking about them. Because every verse talks about the same thing. So, well, it doesn't matter. I can still go to the... The Bible, Bible says that he's the image of the invisible God. Who is, the Im- who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn, I taught you. The firstborn means that he's before any other thing. When it comes to honor, when it comes to value, when it comes to importance, he is before any other thing. He's not in the class of all the others. He's above. He is the firstborn of every creature. For verse, verse 16, for by him were all things created. So he's not a creature. Being the firstborn of every creature, he wouldn't have been, everything wouldn't have been created by him. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominion, please sit down, or principalities or powers. And all things were created by him and for him. He's the owner. All things. Nothing we give to Jesus is too much. Our lives, giving your life to Jesus, you have not done the church a favor, please. Then look at verse 17. It says that 
And it's before all things. And by him, all things consist. He is the one who gives the meaning and the definition and explanation of everything. Nothing makes sense outside of Jesus. That's why he wanted to kill yourself. Nothing makes sense. By him, all things consist. The next verse, I'm going to verse 18. And he is the head of the body. He's the head of what? The body. What's the body? The church. So he's the head of? The church. Who is the head of the church? Yeah. I can't hear you. Who is the head of the church? Yeah. Not the king. He doesn't have what it takes. He used to be the queen. What, why would the church have a head that would die? Please. You are dead if your head dies. But the church is a living, eternally living organism. So Christ is the head of the church, not a pastor. Christ is the head of the church. Who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead? The only one who has been born from the dead and he became the head of the church. That in all things, this, this is where I've been trying to get to. In all things, he might have what? Give us New Living Translation. Let's see how the prayer minutes, if it might use the same prayer minutes. Supreme over all things. Yeah. He is the first in everything. Message. How does the message put it? That's a long one. Leading the resurrection parade. Hey. This one, I didn't know about that one. <laughs> it's a whole parade. <laughs> I didn't know about this one. Leading the red, he's the uh, he is supreme in the end, from beginning to the end. He is there, towering. I like that one. That's the one I'm looking for, towering far above everything and everyone. Now watch this. In our Christian life, that if you have found him. That is the place he, he op, op, occupies in your life. He towers above everything and everyone. If you have actually found him, suddenly you realize that he towers above everything. So then, people with other religion, when they try to talk about him, you feel sorry for them. Because it's just real, you realize how ignorant they are and potentially dumb. Because you have met him who towers above everything and everyone. So when we come to church, the reason why we sing is this. In our song, he must tower above everything and everyone. In our relationships. So if you step on my toe and I don't like it, in my feelings towards you, he must tower above that. Do you, you understand that? He must have the preeminence. So I consider what my relationship is to him before I consider what it is to you. So when you hurt me and I want to hurt you back, I have to consider what my actions are to him before what it actually means to you who I want to hurt back, who I want to prove something to. He must tower above everything. That's if you have found him. If you have found him, then we must grow in this knowledge of him. That we are his increase. And that, sir, that is what the essence of church and preaching is. The essence of preaching is that there will be the increase of Christ in the, in the hearers. There is no need we celebrate any man of God who has not increased Christ in you. This whole thing is about Christ. So we might be, uh, it's your birthday and all that. At the end of the day, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong. If we are doing that because of such a one who points us to Christ, who elevates Christ before us, who makes us know Christ better, who draws us closer to Christ, if you will celebrate him, then I don't care what it costs to celebrate him. Yeah. But let's settle this first, that this thing is Christ. So even our celebration, Christ must tower, must be the towering persona 
terroring factor in our celebration of anything that we honor in church. So, sir, if I celebrate you, I have to think about what my celebrating you will mean to Christ. If I think like that, there's no way I'll divert Christ's honor to you. Because I'm doing that to you because of who Christ is to me and how you have been a blessing towards pushed or make Christ bigger. Help me to find Christ. That Help me to find more of Christ. Help me to discover more of Christ. That's what determines a true prophet. We have found him of whom Moses in the law wrote and the prophets. What kind of prophet is this that Christ is so scarce in your mouth? I'm not talking about mentioning the name of Jesus. Please, even Islam mentions that name. I'm not talking about mentioning the name of Jesus. I'm talking about revealing Christ in your speaking. Please be seated. Oh, I love Jesus. Say, this whole thing is about Jesus. This so when you find out who he is, material things lose him uh, value to you. You use material things to honor him. You use your privileges to honor him. You use your access to honor him. The way you have accepted me, come on, let's do it better for Jesus. Because he deserves better than anybody. Tell her in above all. As I, let me run up and share this. Hebrews chapter 1. The book of Hebrews was dedicated to reveal the towering personality of Christ. You cannot be spiritual and, or let me put it this way. In Romans chapter, is it 10 verse 2? Oh, nine verse two. To them are committed the oracles of God. Mashadakabara. Yeah. To them, it says that much more. So chapter three he said, much more in every way. Talking about the Jews, verse one. Permit me to go back and back and back. What advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Circumcision is, you know, the, the practice of the Jews that keep them in the covenant. So a child, a male, every male on the eighth day of your arrival on earth must be circumcised. As soon as you are circumcised, it means that you have been integrated in the Abrahamic covenant of God. God's people. Because everybody comes from the seed. And the seed comes from the male. So you have to, the male who produces the seed must be circumcised before seed come. So everybody, if you don't come out from a, circu- that's Jews, from a circumcised male, you are not really, you have not come through the proper way. Your flesh is not, is contaminated. Because God formed the Jews to keep a, a, a body has that prepared for me. So to, pre- to keep a people through whom he can prepare the body for his arrival. So every flesh that comes from them must be circumcised. Or every seed that comes from the male must be circumcised because it was paving the way for the arrival of Christ. That's why when Christ came and finished, we don't need the circumcision per se. So watch this. What then? Profit. In what way does a Jew get the advantage over others? Or in in what way does profit? Look at the next verse. He said, much it... Not, not in some way, every way. There's something about being Jewish. Much in every, and above all, chiefly, Kadasha, man. You see, the circumcision is good. But listen, this Bible is a Jewish book. It said, chiefly, to them were committed the oracles. The speakings of God was committed to them. So from the days of old, God makes, made sure his word will stay on earth. So he had to look for a crucible. He had to look for a people who will be committed the word of God that will stay from generation to generation, from generation to generation, until the coming of the Messiah. And he found, he said, I'm committing it to the Jews. That's what even makes them more special, the word that was coming. That's what makes Christianity above every other religion. The word of God we have. The oracles, the oracles, the oracles. 
There's no way anyone can know the true God outside of the oracles. This is the manual of life and the manual that tells us more about God. The speakings of God are found here. So Satan will find every way to attack and challenge it. But don't mind him, it's too late. So the oracles of God were committed to the Jews. Now watch this, the reason why I said this. Because, so, if you want to, can someone tell me a little bit, like in those days, can someone tell me a little bit about this God of heaven, this God called Yahweh? You have to go to the Jews. Other nations have gods. They had gods. And those gods don't come and they're all creatures. But if you want to talk about the true God, the true God, then go to the Jew. I hear even the Quran said, you know, go to the Christians. Go to the people of the book. Oracles. <laughs> The oracles of God were committed. You want to understand God in those days before Jesus came? Go to the Jews. You want to understand spiritual things? Go to the Jews. You want to know about angels? Do angels really, angels really exist? Go to the Jews. And so the core elements of spirituality that were committed to the Jews were, first of all, the speakings of the prophet. Secondly, the angels. Thirdly, the the hype the priest priest priesthood system or moses and the priesthood system so to a jew when you mention the priesthood system hey don't go there this is this is this is not in our realm they give it high reverence and double honor to the jew when you mention moses moses <laughs> hey moses that you, if you mention the prophets the prophets that's why they said moses abraham our father and moses they are dead and you say anyone who read your or who listen to your word will not die. Didn't we say you have a devil? Yeah. yeah. John chapter 8 from verse 48 downwards. Did we not say that you have a reason? You you are you are you greater than our father, our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets who are dead. Who do you make yourself to be? You. What do you make me, who do you make your what, 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 what do you think? Then the Jews said. Now we know you have a demon. Because Abraham is dead. And the, and the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste. Taste it. You said that? Yeah, because Jesus tasted dead for us. When a Christian is dying, it can be the most peaceful aspect in his life. Those of you who are in the medical profession, nurses and doctors, if you see a Christian dying, just observe it. It's so peaceful. Most unbelievers, when they die, <laughs> you go and check. Because death is very chilling. The grips of death is grim. It's, it's, it's bitter to test death. So Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible said, he tested death for us. <laughs> it says that, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Not everyone who is alive, those of us who are in him, everyone who is in Christ, so that you don't have to taste death. In, in John chapter 11, verse 25, he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Come on, shut the higher. Oh, yes. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall not live. Look at verse 26. Look at, look at verse 26. Look at it. And, and whoever lives and believes in me, he shall never die. When you look, I think the NIV says he shall never taste death. Oh, one of the verses, it talks about he shall never taste death. When you go down, say, never taste death. Why? Because Jesus Christ tasted it for us. So when a believer is dying, it's a peaceful journey. It's a nice transition. It's a nine Bible talks about how, how, how glorious the death of a saint. It's precious in the sight of God. Yeah, he said, precious in the sight of God is the death of a saint. Because when a Christian is about to die, all of a sudden, in fact, there have been instances where people, yeah, in Psalm 116 verse 15, precious in the sight of the is the death of his saints. There have been instances where some people were, they almost checked out, like in coma, and they checked out. And another zealous, like a mother, 
pastors and sons and daughters or a husband, very fiery Christian, praise God, my wife cannot die. And then they come and say, why did you disturb me? I preferred where I was. There have been instances where people check in a little bit and say, ah, this is good. Usually when Christians are about to die, there are angels who come and take them out. They are ready. No, oh, they're coming home of a saint. Jesus tested them. So they said, who do you make yourself to be? And the reference point was, he didn't even mention Moses. He didn't mention Moses. He didn't mention the prophet. But he was teaching them a truth, some truth. John 8 from verse, verse 48. He was teaching them truth. Then he told them that if you believe in me, you won't die. Then they said, who do you make yourself to be? Moses, Abraham is dead. The prophets are dead. So the reference point of real spirituality for the Jews to whom was committed the oracles of God is you're talking about the prophets you're talking about Moses you're talking about angels you're talking about the, the high priest and the priests those, those are the, the mediatorial processes or media, media, mediatorial junctures to, to contacting God you cannot say you have a relationship with God without having encounters with angels in the Old Testament prophets High priest, Moses. These are the elements. Then Hebrew comes on the scene. The book of Hebrews. It was written to Hebrews. It was written to Hebrews. Hebrews. Abraham the Hebrew. It was written to Hebrews. And the, the book of Hebrews comes on the scene. And Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. It says, God. God. God who in, in sundry times. Keep us, keep us in the new King James. God. God who in times past, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to our fathers by, by the prophets. Praise by God in times past. Please sit down, sit down. We're going to have to finish. Now. God in the days that's talking about the oracles, the days when the Jews had the Torah, the, the all they had was the prophets and the Torah. I said, God in those days. So Isaiah will stand and Isaiah will say to the king, that's here's the Lord. And the new God was talking. Jeremiah will say, that's what the Lord is saying. The new God was talking. God is always a speaking God. That's why everybody who, got to rec who received the Holy Spirit, Spirit spoke out. Because God is a speaking God. So they will say, that's here the Lord, that's here the Lord. And everybody knew that Isaiah is a seasoned prophet. Jeremiah is a seasoned prophet. Amos is a seasoned prophet. Zechariah is a seasoned prophet. Daniel is a seasoned prophet. The prophets prophesied. Suddenly, the Bible is saying, saying that God, who in times past, in various ways, spoke to our fathers by the prophets, look at verse 2, has in these last days my God. So he says, what does that mean? Your, wait, is it grandfather or grandmother? Your father tells you something, or your grandmother, te your grandfather tells you something. You say, I'm going to ask my father. <laughs> what your father is telling you, your grandfather taught him. Yeah. 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 It's, it's just an, an, an expression. When you find Jesus, didn't you hear in Matthew, Matthew chapter 17, this verse 3, this is my beloved son. Oh, come on. Okay, a voice came and overshadowed. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. He's the one to be heard. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, 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 wow. Everything the prophets have said, what he says is final. So, quickly, he said, Jesus is better than the prophets. Because the value of a prophet or what a prophet does is not dancing. It's not singing. A prophet does what? Speaks forth. So he said, God spoke through the prophets. In these last days now, he has made them redundant. He's speaking through his son. <laughs> Who he has appointed the head of all, the, the heir of all things. Through whom also he made the world. He's appeared again. Colossians, he made the world through him, it appeared again. So he said, he's saying, what he's saying here is that God used to speak by the prophets, but now he has closed the books of the prophets. 
everything that God ever has to say, you got to go to Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, and if you are not in Christ, you are in crisis. If you are not in Christ, you won't hear from God. If you are not in Christ, you, it doesn't matter. You can be a Jew, born of a circumcised father. You are alienated from the life of God. So prophets, God who in times past spoke to, this time he's speaking to the son. Then in the same chapter one, he began to bring the angels. So when you read from the verse five, he, began, he, he dropped angels. Oh, let's go to four. Let's go to four. Let's go to four. Having become so much better than the angels. Ah, Jesus Christ has become so much better than the angels. Now, you say angels to a Jew, you, he knows what you're, what you're talking about. And he said, this are Jesus is better than the angels. He's better than the prophets. These are the, the core elements, the junctions, the mediatorial personalities and personas, the mediatorial elements for reaching to God. The prophets, and now he said angels, he's having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance e obtained a more excellent name than every other name. Amen. To this only you. He has obtained a more excellent name than the angel. It doesn't matter angel Gabriel, angel Michael, a, a, any of the angels. None of them. None of them come anywhere close to him. So if you want to be really spiritual, this time to drop the angels. When someone say, angels have been coming to my room. Please don't be, don't be impressed or intimidated by those things. Whether it's true or it's not true, it's irrelevant. I, I was asleep and I saw an angel came to me. And did, did, did that experience draw you closer to Christ? Yes, it did. I started feeling so nice about Jesus. Has it produced godly fruits and fruits for the building of the church? Because Jesus is doing one, only one thing. Oh. I'm not talking about he's just behaving nice. He's building the church. If you meet him and he has touched you, you'll be a church builder. Uh, let, let me just throw a little bit more light on it. Who do men say I am? Who do you say I am? Peter said, you are the son, the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed you, but my father, verse 18, and I tell you the truth, you are Peter. Upon this rock I will build. Build, he's a builder. So if you have really met him and your heart is for him, you will join him in building. How come you see, you've been, you are talking about revelations and meeting angels and you are so useless in the church building? Useless. You are full of personal revelations to embellish your ego. The what really shows that you have actually encountered Christ is it produces the building of the church. Because he's the head of the church. Head, not organizational head, but organism, head, as the head of an organism. The head that makes the decision, the life flows through the head. Jesus is building the church. Let me finish, sit down. Is someone learning son? Let every other name So, those who have a problem about our celebrating men of God or genuine men of God, we celebrate because of the Christ they project. See, when they don't have Christ, they get concerned because they think that mm, you are making this man of God more important. But when you have Christ, you know that actually this Christ came through this. Oh. <laughs> this in fact, the more I get closer to him, I'm beginning to find out that I'm becoming more Christ-like, more Christ-focused, more Christ-centered. Yes, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the cause. Church is about Christ. If you keep coming to church and Christ is not being formed in you, there's something wrong with you or there's something wrong with the preaching. Yeah. Because there are people going to church and Christ is not forming in them. It's not them, it's the preaching. Because the preachers are always preaching about what does not produce. He said, I labor, I travel again. 
Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. That Christ be formed, cut about shall my little children, a little children, for whom I labor in birth again. <laughs> that Christ be formed in you. That Christ. When he pleased, this is Galatians chapter 1, verse, verse 15 and 16. When he pleased God, who separated me from my, fa- my mother's womb, not my father's womb, my mother's womb, to reveal, you see the verse 16, to reveal, the reason why he separated me is to reveal Christ in me. He, so when I show up, Christ will be revealed. Yeah. Christ will be. That's the essence of Christianity. Yeah. That's the essence of powerful preaching. Powerful preaching is not the one that makes you yeah, very excited. It's the one that makes Christ be formed in you, that Christ can be revealed in you. By the time you are getting home, people who have known you know that, no, this is a different person, not just by virtue of behavior, but by virtue of a life that is being revealed in you. So Jesus is better than the prophets. Jesus is bigger than the, the, the angels. And then he adds the third one, chapter 3. We branch his Moses. Every house is built by someone, verse 6. Every house. He said, Moses was faithful in all his house. Oh, my God. And he was trying to point that Jesus was bigger and better than Moses. Then towards the end of chapter 5, when you go to verse 10, verse 11, then he drops a bigger name than Moses. He drops a name, Melchizedek. He drops Melchizedek. And he said, concerning this Melchizedek, we have a lot to say about but it's difficult to talk since you are dull of hearing. Oh, for by this time, when you ought to be teachers, you need to be taught again the elementary things of God. <laughs> Chapter 6, verse 1. Don't, now, let us move away from just the basic things and let us go to maturity. Let's move away from the uh, foundations, foundations. Yeah. Yeah. Then he hits on that. So he touched on Melchizedek. Yeah. But that Melchizedek was so heavy profile that he said, we, I, we have a lot, verse 11, chapter 5. We have a lot of whom we have much to say, but it's hard to explain. And the problem is not us, but since you are dull of hearing. We have a lot to say, but it's hard to talk about because you are dull of hearing. Then he asks, explains why we are dull of hearing. For by this time, you still need counseling on how to stop masturbating. Listen, some people have come to the church, but they are not in Christ. None of us is, is perfect. When you are in Christ, sinning becomes willful. But you get over it. After you sin, you feel very uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. You, you are very measured when you are engaging somebody to join you in sin. You are so restricted that what you want to do, you just are not free to do it because you represent the Christ. And when you do it, it takes a long time to. Nobody, no genuine Christian falls at once. You are there, but one day you just pass like, no, 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 no. It started coming months ago. Yes. Months ago. Is it, is it, is it no, not true? Yeah. yeah. It started months ago. No Christian for the case suddenly. Because Holy Ghost will interrupt you for so long. A lot of other things. Is. No Christian for the case. Sort of you, those of you who have been fornicating suddenly every time. Don't, don't come and sit in front of me and think you are learning the words. You know what words to say to impress me. You are joking. You're joking. I can see through you. But for political reason and courtesy reasons, I may not say anything, but I can see through you. Oh, no one, I mean, even Pastor Charles, Pastor Frank, the pastors here, having been around for a while, we, we see a lot of things people don't give us credit for. You can't you can easily say, I'm impressing you because of you. No. Our joy is that you be, you, the Christ in you will grow. Christ will be revealed in you. That's what makes us men of God. That's what makes, not the suits we wear, not the people who listen to us, not our following, but our, our drive that Christ will be revealed in others. 
That's what makes a person a man of God. So think about yourself if you're a man of God. Think about yourself if you're a woman of God. Your revelations and visions and encounters and dreams are bogus if it doesn't lead to this. That's one of the reasons I wanted you to come close. That's why I want to because revelations don't make a person a man of God. Muhammad had a very powerful revelation. Joseph Smith. Deep revelations. People have it. We have got it. Even Peter, didn't he have the one Jesus said, this one was given to you from, but a few chapter verses later, it was going off. So how can you build the entirety of your Christian life on revelations and revelations that are subjective? Most, most mental health challenges start with see, revelations. They hear things and see things that no one is seeing. <laughs> Some of the things cannot be uttered. <laughs> so, stick with the oracles. Stick with it. And learn how to discover Christ in the oracles. Not by looking for strange things no one has said. That's the, the Gnostics. They think there's something you don't know. There's nothing. Everything is here. So the job of a pastor is make sure, to make sure that Jesus has the preeminence by pointing him from the book and everybody to the book. He's bigger than angels, bigger than the prophets, bigger than Moses, bigger than the high priest. That is the Jesus. Jesus is. Jesus is. Thank you for listening to this message by David Entry. We pray you have been strengthened and enlightened. You can connect with David Entry on all relevant social media platforms, including Instagram and LinkedIn. You can also hear more messages from David Entry on all relevant streaming platforms and the Caris Church app. Don't forget to like and share the message. Be blessed.